from Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Wow, summer is almost gone. The little ones are back to school and uh, we'll def- deflate the, uh, the waiting pool and um, put away the sunscreen. Wow, where did it go? I hope you, uh, you had a good summer wherever you are. The Mighty Aphrodite was just up at uh, Casino Rama last week. I was in L.A., and I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but the Mighty Aphrodite went up with a friend to see Barry Manilow. You know, he's getting on in age, but he can still bring it, apparently. Wonderful performance, and she had a great time. Just great seats, and and, and uh, hopefully, before the summer is out, we'll get up there again and uh, see some great acts. Particularly, I mean, I'm a big classic rock fan, and some, some of these bands, you know, they lose a couple of members. Uh, they're no longer, you know, filling the arenas uh, or the, the the football stadiums, but they're still around, and um, you can it's, it's a great opportunity to see them in probably one of the best facilities in terms of the sound quality. Like Ringo Starr plays up there every year, several times a year, and he raves about it. And all the artists that come and play at Casino Rama, it's just the sound is absolutely incredible. Uh, so if you haven't been up there this summer, uh, or in, in the fall, try and, try and catch a concert at Casino Rama. Obviously there's much more to do up there, but, uh, as a music fan, I'll tell you. All right, um, what else? Oh, I, I, you know, I was, um, uh, this past summer I was working on another project and I was, uh, I, I produced a documentary about this, I produced about ten of them, and 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 uh, one of them was about this orthopedic surgeon down in upstate New York. And back in the late '90s, he was struck by lightning, and he was at a telephone booth when he was struck by lightning. The the flash came out of the phone and struck him in the face, and he was knocked backwards. But as he's being knocked backwards, his his body is falling backwards. He actually feels himself moving forward, and he thought, "Well, this is kind of strange. I know I've just hit, been been hit by lightning." And uh, and yet I'm moving forward, and my body seems to be falling backwards. And then he sees his mother-in-law running down the stairs, screaming. And instead of stopping and and talking to him and saying, "Are you okay?" she just walks right by, or runs right by him. And then he turns and he sees his body lying on the ground. Classic NDE, am I right? The near-death experience. Uh, and then as he started to move towards the pavilion where the rest of his family had gathered, he notices that he's becoming, well, he's becoming invisible. His legs are disappearing, and he's, uh, he's, he's feeling just an incredible amount of unconditional love, and he turns around, and there's a nurse happened to be standing behind him at the payphone performing uh, CPR, and she revives him, and bam, he's back in his body. That's a classic NDE, and I had a, um, a chance to sit down and talk with this guy. This is a man of science, and this changed the course of his life, and why wouldn't it? And it does, countless times, uh, people that experience a near-death experience. We're going to talk about that right now and for the next hour. Dr. Lani Leary has over 25 years' experience working as a psychotherapist, and uh, she's called a professor of death studies. We'll find out about more about that in a moment. Uh, she served as the director of mental health services at uh, Whitman Walker AIDS Clinic as a professor of death studies, as I mentioned, at George Mason University and as a researcher at the National Cancer Institute of NIH, the National Institute of Health. She's also the author of a fascinating new book called No One Has to Die Alone and a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Leary to The Conspiracy Show. Hello, doctor. Hello. Thanks for having me. A professor of death studies. I've not heard of such a, a, a field. Uh, tell me more about that. Uh, Well, the field is actually called thanatology, after the Greek god uh, Thanos, which is um, about death. Um, But there are are some uh, universities and colleges that have programs in death education. And in my, um, it was a uh, graduate course at the university, George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. And I had nurses and psychology students, uh, clinical psychology students, counselors, educators um, in the class because, of course, all of those people would encounter people with end-of-life issues and grief issues, and we need to train them. And uh, we just don't do a very good job in our culture of um, even speaking about the subject. It's true. Uh, death is has really been sanitized uh, here in in the West, um, yeah. where we we hand the body over to professionals. It's taken mm-hmm. away. The body literally is is, is sanitized. Uh, where you know, a hundred years ago, everyone had a front parlor, and that's where the funeral was held. And uh, 
Uh, of course, and you have in, in certain cultures where the family members gather together, they they wash the body, they anoint right. the body, they take it to the funeral pyre, they burn the body, and so forth. Mm-hmm. We we really do have an aversion not only to talking about it, but even uh, just uh, uh, dealing with it. And and here you have sat with over 500 people as they died. As they died, and and thousands of others in the process. Yes, it was the greatest privilege of my life. And 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 how. How has that shaped uh, the way that you you feel about uh, about death? Are you, I mean, do you, are you are you afraid to die? Well, no, I'm not afraid to die. Um, and it, in I would say it's uh, two segments of that. Um, I'm not afraid to die because of my own near death experience, and that I have been there and uh, and am back. Um, and so I've, I've seen what it is, and I know. I know so many things about uh, death and dying, the process, and I know that um, I was actually told I had to come back because I had work to do, and I knew that this was the work that I was to do. Um, But the other thing is that I'm also not afraid of dying because of all of the things that these very courageous patients have taught me. And I do ask um, direct questions. I do speak to them about the process because I know that so many people pull away uh, at this very, very intimate time. And the dying really want to share the experience. What they're most afraid of is being emotionally or physically abandoned. And so I I really uh, see my job as companioning them right up to the threshold and and almost as a midwife um, on the other end. That's an interesting way of looking at it. We have midwives bringing us in, and why, yeah. so why not midwives taking us out? Absolutely. Tell me more about your NDE, your near-death experience. Um, I was uh, 28 and a half and had um, a two-year-old baby, which I, of course, adored, and a husband, and um, everything was going well in my life. I went to a, um, a just a regular dentist appointment and was given nitrous oxide. Um, this is um, back in the early 80s. And, um, and laughing an, gas. Laughing as gas. an anesthesia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Laughing gas, right. And uh, my body went into anaphylactic shock. It just had an allergic reaction to the, um, to the nitrous oxide. I don't think it was anyone's fault. And um, I... I was in the dentist chair one minute, and the next thing I knew, without any pain, which is important, uh, was out of my body and up on my consciousness, was up on the ceiling, looking down at this um, inert body, which I felt a fondness for, but no attachment. I really, I felt as though it was a kind of a worn out, now, mind you, I'm only 28 years old at the time, but kind of a worn out piece of clothing that had taken me to some really great adventures. Um, I kind of worn this body to a lot of parties kind of thing, but um, it no longer served me. I didn't need it. And I really knew that it was not me. And that is, that's a, a second important lesson. And um, there was no sense of time, so I can't tell you how long I was up in the corner um, ceiling but I do know that I was trying to comfort the dentist and trying to communicate with him that I was okay and he didn't need to be anxious or, you know, afraid, but of course he didn't get the message. Um, the next thing I knew, I was going into a beautiful tunnel, um, and the tunnel was kind of an opalescent blue, beautiful, beautiful mother of pearl color, and my mother was right at the entrance of that tunnel, and my mother had died uh, 15 years earlier. Uh, my mother died when I was 13, very une- quickly and unexpectedly. And um, I had a lot of grief, a lot of regret and pain about that because I didn't say goodbye to her. I didn't get to visit her in the hospital. And it just felt like there was a lot of unfinished business. But when, um, when I, I, I saw her, I recognized her. And what's important in that encounter, the third lesson that I use, is that um, in death there is healing because my mother um, actually hemorrhaged to death and and, um, was pretty broken. And um, in that encounter she was whole and vibrant and beautiful and radiant and healthy. So um, in death she had been healed. And we communicated telepathically. And in other words, I thought and she received and she thought and I received. 
and um, I could because there was such a sense of timelessness, and, uh, and I didn't feel rushed. I felt no fear. I felt no anxiety. I really knew that I could have um, spent all the time I wanted catching up, kind of in my life. But that was my that would have been my ego's response if I had you know if. if back here if someone had said to me, well, Lonnie, if you could see your mother, what would you say to her? Uh, the ego would say, oh, I'd tell her about 15 years of experiences. But when I had the opportunity in the tunnel, uh, it was my heart that responded. And what I knew, there was a, a deep, deep sense of wisdom, I don't know another word, um, that um, uh, my mother, I knew that my mother had never left me. She had always been with me. And in fact, she knew all those little details of my life that I had thought I needed to communicate to her. Um, and so with that knowing, I, um, I, I, next, I noticed a light off in the far distance. And I, and I was just like I was a, you know, uh, it, it was a magnet to me and I had to go to it. And so uh, I'm still surprised that I left my mother, but uh, it was all okay. And that's another big lesson, that it, it's all okay. If I could just interject here for a moment, Dr. Leary. Yeah. At any point, are you seeing uh, people in the dentist's office trying to resuscitate you? Were you clinically dead, uh, do we know, at this point? Yes. Oh, when I was up at the corner of the room, I mean, I didn't hear the pronouncement that I'm clinically dead, but but I knew that I was not breathing. I knew my heart had stopped, and my and the doc, the dentist was trying to work on me. But after I left the room, my consciousness was no longer in the room, so I wasn't witnessing what was happening. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, but I I was pulled towards this light, and as I went into the tunnel, I heard this beautiful, beautiful music. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but um, I heard music, beautiful colors, and I was going towards this light, and the light got bigger and bigger as I got closer to it, or sensed that I was getting closer to it. Let me just stop you right there again. We have some other music coming in, maybe not the music you heard, but this is a music that's going to pull me not towards the light, but into a commercial break. Back on the other side with Dr. Lonnie Leary, the author of No One Has to Die Alone. Where there's smoke, there's The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Dr. Lonnie Leary is a professor of death studies at George Mason University, and or rather she served as the director of mental health services at uh, Whitman Walker AIDS Clinic. Are you still a professor of death studies at George Mason? No, actually, that was in Virginia, and I have moved home to Hawaii now. Ah, okay. And so I'm, I'm serving um, and consulting with hospices and in private practice uh, with people at the end of their life. All right, and she's the author of No One Has to Die Alone. She has sat with over 500 people as they died. Back to your near-death experience. Now you're, you're, you're seeing this incredible light. You're feeling this unconditional love, which seems to be a universal yeah. experience with people that have, that have had an, an, an NDE. Continue, Dr. Leary. Right, right. Um, and I'm, I'm moving towards the present, this, this light, and this light is becoming bigger and brighter. Um, and what I experience is the light is in front of me, and then the light is all around me, and then I am in the light, and what I know is that I am of the same substance as the light. The light and I are one. And I want to stay there forever. I feel as though I'm home. Um, the word bliss does not even come close to the experience, but really knowing an unconditional love that um, is uh, you know, I've just never experienced before, and I wanted to stay there. And then again, um, telepathically, but I felt it in my consciousness. The light said to me, "You must go back." And I yelled, "No!" with uh, all the force that I had. And again, the light said, "You must go back. You have work to do." And I yelled again, "No!" And then I felt as though I was coming back through the tunnel, almost like I was in a blender. It was very kind of disoriented and um, certainly um, disheartening. Um, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't confused. I knew that it happened, but, and then I was uh, conscious again in the dentist chair. But um, How long were you gone? Uh, about eight to ten minutes. 
and the dentist had never had that experience before and really just I, I mean, didn't say so, but pretty much just wanted to make sure that I was okay and um, oriented and um, and even let me drive home. He did? Yeah. Wow. Now, uh, I'm guessing uh, he probably closed shop for the day. At least I know I would if something like that happened. But yeah. now in eight minutes, in eight minutes, um, would that would that mean that um, uh, you would have been technically brain dead for a short period of time? You know, there are all kinds of reports of people having this experience for even longer, and and it's not documented. The dentist didn't document this. I mean, I don't have this in my dental records. Um, that's the best, you know, guesstimate that I have from what he was saying. Um, but, no, there was, well, obviously there was no brain death. Um, the um, And I believe, you know, he thought he resuscitated me, um, and it doesn't matter to me. I mean, he, he can have the credit. That's fine. Um, but the experience absolutely changed the course of my life. I guess so. I and guess it so. was after that um, that I started working in hospice because I, I knew I knew things about death, and um, I needed to be near people who were dying, and I didn't tell the story. I Actually, I didn't tell. My husband knew something was um Something had transformed in me immediately just by looking at me. But I didn't tell the story um, to anyone because I really felt that I would have been judged or ridiculed, but certainly judged because it sounded like I was a horrible mother, that I was saying no to my baby who needed me, um, you know, to, in order to stay in the light. Um, I was saying yes to that love and peace. Um, I wasn't saying no to my child or my husband, but um, I, I'm certainly not afraid. I really think it's an adventure. I, um, I have great peace. If I die tomorrow, I have great peace about it. And in fact, I live my life as though I am going to die tomorrow so that there isn't any unfinished business. But I take what I know to the bedside of patients and also to the bereaved because, you know, um, to me, really, the, the story isn't the near-death experience. That's not the story. The story is what happens to people, who they are when they come back, because this is a transformative experience, and there are characteristics of, um, you know, most people that come back um, that people are changed. And, and how could um, you not be? Let me let exactly. me um, offer up the, uh, the old... Um, uh, counter from that comes from the what I call the materialists who uh-huh. believe that consciousness resides inside the human skull and that's it and that's all she wrote. Right. Uh, and they would say that what you experienced was a result of I guess it's referred to as cerebral hypoxia, lack of oxygen to the brain. How do you respond? Well, the the, the difference is that what happened to me is uh, now how many years are we talking about? Thirty years after this experience. The experience is still so vivid, but my life, the way I live my life is very different. And I guess I would just have to say that the proof is in the pudding. Um, um, You know, I don't try to prove this. It it doesn't matter. I I think the proof is is in my life, and uh, it's certainly consistent with all the other um, research in near-death experience. Mm -hmm. you know, from uh, no sense of of, um, of of fear, no no fear of death. Um, certainly, becoming more spiritual and less religious. Um, uh, just knowing that life has a purpose. All of those things, and then really using my life in service. Um, also, in in you know, increased intuitive um, and psychic abilities. A lot less stressed. Um, a real hunger for knowledge and growing. Um, all of those things are the, the byproduct of, of this experience. So I, I want to take that and I take it to the bedside. And people know, people who are dying will share things with me that they don't share with other people. And in fact, often, often um, at the very end, they'll say to me, you know, don't you? You know something. So is it your contention, Dr. Leary, or not your contention, but is it your uh, belief that 
all of us will experience that same that 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 feeling of uh, uh, of love, universal yes. love. We will yes. see the light. We will see our our, our ancestors who have passed on. Yes. Uh, but only a short number of us will actually come back and get to talk about it. Right, and and I don't I don't know why that is. Um, um, you know, I, I probably have you know I've got work to do. I've got lessons to learn, and um, so I'm back. Um, it wasn't up to me. Um, I have talked with people um, who did have a choice, but I didn't have a choice. Um, but yeah, when I was in the presence of that light, what I knew without without any doubt, and I still hold this so firmly, is that there is an, I didn't need to ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness was instant. I was loved beyond all measure. Um, and, and I also knew that there were many paths to that light. And I think that's what happens to a lot of us who come back is that we turn from the dogma of um, religious uh, institutions and become much broader and inclusive and um, spiritual. Now, but uh, yes, I really believe all of us will be will have that unconditional acceptance and love. It, my uh, narrow experience with NDEs, NDEs, just as a broadcaster and talking to people like yourself who have uh, who've, who've had one, and as I mentioned off the top, I, I recently spoke to a Dr. Anthony Sicoria. Um, who was actually included in, in a chapter in a book by Oliver Sacks. Uh-huh. Um, he struck by lightning, uh, had a just a classic NDE. Mm-hmm. And um, but what happened to him afterwards was it um, uh, he became fascinated with uh, obsessed with classical music and wanting to learn the piano. Right. Well, did. that's part of that. That's part of what people come back to. Also, they're very sensitive to light and to sound. And um, I, I couldn't walk into noisy groups for a long time. And people are drawn to the classical music. But the way that it changed his life, actually, uh, because he he needed to seek answers. And his this was a man of science. This is an orthopedic surgeon. Yep. Um, who now his entire life was just rocked and he and it ended up uh at least initially destroying his marriage they've since yeah. reconciled but i mean it can be difficult i'm guessing for the people that around the person who's had an nde yes it uh, can be very difficult very yes very in in fact this is an interesting statistic that 65 percent of marriages uh of, of near-death experiencers marriages um, end in divorce after this experience, as opposed to like 50% of the general population, because people, when this happens to you, your values are changed, careers are changed, religious views are changed. And I mean, I knew when I came back that my husband had to be on board with me. There was, uh, there was no, there wasn't going to be a negotiation. My life was going to be of service. And he could either be with me in that or not. And how did that work out? How yeah. did that? Did it work it out? It worked out just fine. Good, he's, good to know. He's a huge supporter, and um, um, you know, it, on his own, on his, on a different path, but um, absolutely supports me. Um, but that doesn't surprise me that um, his marriage would fall apart, and that his career would change, and his focus would change. That's not uncommon. And uh, when you sit, when you, you sit with a dying patient. Uh-huh. Uh, now, these are people that are terminally ill, and for them, yeah. there's no coming back. But did, is there, in their final moments, did you do you get a glimpse that they are that they are undergoing this these same sorts of uh, experiences, the bright light, yeah. meeting up with ancestors? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's called a near death awareness, as a, as opposed to a near death experience. A near death awareness, and and oh, I'll tell you, Richard, I absolutely teach this and and um, encourage people to learn how to listen to the dying and really open up to the symbolic language. Um, and because I am um, open and encouraging of it uh, and, and can ask questions, um, the dying often tell me of visits from loved ones who had predeceased them. And it's very, very common for the dying to see someone enter the room. And I mean, I've, I've watched, um, I've watched patients almost, you know, argue, um, take me now, take me now, you know. Um, or another patient will talk about, uh, will say to me, Lonnie, do you see that train? 
the train's coming again. Um, and I'll say, well, do you think it's time to get on the train? Or tell me, is there somebody else on the train that's waiting for you? And, you know, just that, just the opening, the wondering allows them to explore it instead of be afraid of it. But generally, they're not afraid because these are loved ones who are coming. And even children, um, when I was um, at NIA, the National Institute of Health um, and working, um, there were children who were dying of AIDS, and um, we would speak to the parents after the death. And so important to be able to ask open questions such as, now this is to a bereaved parent, I would say to them, have you had any experience of your son since he died? And they would just lean into me and thank me profusely for asking that question because they so wanted to talk about the after-death communication or their child coming to them in a very, very vivid and meaningful dream. And usually, uh, you know, consistently the message from the deceased is, it's okay, I'm okay, um, and I'll see you again. And you can imagine the significance of of validating that experience for a bereaved parent. It makes all the difference in the world in how they grieve. And yet, for the majority, they don't get that after-death communication. I'm guessing, I don't know what the statistics are. I mean, an, an awful lot do, and they, uh-huh. and, they t- and they talk to me on the program, but uh, um, most don't, I'm guessing. And why well, is that? Well, those parents, I did a study, and those parents, um, actually, the, the um, statistic was 86% of parents did report that really, and I'm going. To, and I'll tell you one of the most fascinating stories. So um, I knew I was going to get a you know a lot of skepticism and flack about this, and so I wanted to do another study with the most difficult I thought um, population, and so I chose to study parents who had children die of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Oh dear! And mm. these were pre-verbal infants. And I polled a large group of parents at the International SIDS uh, conference, and the statistic came back the same, about 85, 86%. And, you know, you would say, well, you know, how can children who are preverbal communicate? It, these parents had a visceral sense um, that their child was okay. They saw them. They got that, you know, they got that... Um, that smile or that glint in their eye or something, but these parents were absolutely convinced. Eighty-six percent message from their child that they were okay. I'm absolutely uh, gobsmacked at that statistic. Eighty-six yeah. percent. All right, we'll take a time out. We'll come back. The phone lines are filling up. New York, Sydney, Toronto want to weigh in on the near-death experience. Back with more in a moment. The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. You want the truth? You can handle the truth. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. To get to the truth, call Richard now at 416-360-0740. Welcome back. Dr. Lonnie Leary is with us, and uh, we're talking about near-death experiences, and her book is No One Has to Die Alone. Let's get to the phones, and welcome Derek from New York. Welcome, Derek. Yeah, hi, Richard. Uh, Doctor. Yes. Yeah, you didn't mention about how long ago your experience was. Well, she did, actually. But mine, which was of a similar nature, was in 1969. Just like mm-hmm. you said, mm-hmm. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I can't yeah, tell you what vivid, I had. right? Yeah, I can't tell you what I had for dinner two nights ago, but yeah. I can tell you every little facet of that thing. Right. And w- there's a reason for that that I don't hear yourself or anybody else when they talk about this stressing. And that is, I notice with my own experience... The thing that was the most proof to me beyond the three that you gave Richard when Richard asked you in the initial, initially when you, whether you feared death and you said, you know, being out in the ceiling and being outside your body and all these things were proofs to you. But the, the, the biggest proof to me, because I concur with every experience you had, but the overwhelming thing to me was when I came out of the whole thing, the sense of reality of the experience. Now, let me just clarify that. When you're dreaming, the dream seems real. And when you wake up from the dream, you realize you were dreaming. Why do you realize you were dreaming? Because when you're in this reality here, it has more of a substance of realness to you. So you realize, oh, that was only a dream. 
Mm-hmm. And in the same respect, the dream fades. You know, like you can remember it right when you wake up, yes. but midday you try and recall the dream. You can't remember all the little facets about it. Right, it's that's very state fleeting. consciousness. Right. It's like, and here you are in this reality, and if I ask you what you had for uh, breakfast uh, three days ago, unless you have the same thing every day, you might not remember. Right. But you can remember every facet of that. Mm-hmm. That's and the reason point. is the reality of that, like the way this is to a dream, that yes. is to this. Right. You follow what I'm saying? I do. And nobody it's... talks about that aspect of it. Yeah, the, it's it's coming back to a thinner uh, reality and as though, well, I think many of us walk around really knowing what's important in a, in a different way. And um, and we we don't take ourselves as seriously. We may take the work seriously, but we're able to see things um, much more um, abstractly, and e- even from a grander not grander from a from a more philosophical point of view. But there's really an expansiveness. Uh, Derek, very very quickly, if you could, what what were the circumstances uh, which led to your near death experience? Excuse me. Uh, quickly, what were the circumstances? Oh, it was a drowning thing. It was a drowning. Mm. That went too far. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. And again, bright light. Uh, uni- uh, no, the tunnel thing that 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 was not there. And some of the people, because I I worked as a lifeguard, and my curiosity about this prior to 1969 started with dealing with with a few patients that have like were drowned and through <coughs> artificial respiration, you know, to bring them back. Mm-hmm. Not everybody, but a small percentage of them would recount the same kind of story. Mm-hmm. You know, like they were somewhere else. <laughs> there was a b- bright light. It was very. They felt very loved and everything. You know, yeah. and they all said the same thing consistently. Yeah. And that's what got my that's what got my initial curiosity. I didn't know that it was in the cards for me. Mm-hmm. You know, within about a year after that, but. Like, just going through the experience, I, uh, you know, the last thing, you, you're different, and I take my hat off to you that you're trying to help people with their transition, but because of what you're left with and the sense of the unreality, so so to speak, of this, I'm living in this reality, so I'm making the most of it. I cherish every moment of life, mm-hmm. but I know beyond that that this is not real. Excellent point. Excellent mm-hmm. point. And that's why we remember it, because it's more real than what we're living and experiencing yeah. right now. Yeah. Great call from New York, Derek. Thank you for that. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Chris is up next, and she is in Sydney, Australia. Chris, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Hi, Richard. It's a he. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I Chris. I don't know why I... I, I nice Hi, to meet Chris. you, Chris. I've got a quick question. I should have another quick question. Just is there any documentation or any sort of study of diagnosed sociopaths having near-death experience and what's been reported back from that? I'm sorry, is there any research about what? Diagnosed sociopaths. Oh. So people who are true sociopaths, they seem to lack uh, empathy. Right. Some people say... That's an interesting question. That would be an interesting study and that they come back and... Um, their sociopathy has changed. Um, I, you know, I don't know any of those. Um, I don't know that that study... Uh, I don't know anything about that, but boy, would that be interesting. I'd really love to follow that. Wouldn't that be, uh, wouldn't that be proof? The, yeah, healing, so, the oh, healing that you can come back with. And, and also, uh, along the same lines, have there been individuals who have had a near-death experience that wasn't positive, perhaps? Yes, actually there are. Um, it's rare, um, but there is a percentage that have. Um, I couldn't tell you that right now. It's it's less, um, but um, people have uh, met lessons. You know, that, In other words, a lot of people, I did not have a life review, but a lot of people have a life review, and in that life review, um, uh, I've heard that people feel everything that they have ever thought towards others. Well, if that's the case, you know, we would probably run up against our own maliciousness or the errors of our way, and yeah. then it, that might feel like hell, right? Yeah, I'll bet. That's not something I'm looking forward to. All right, we'll take a time out, come back. Uh, Chris in Sydney, thank you for the call. We'll get to some more when we come back. The Conspiracy Show discussing near-death experiences. Stay with us. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. 
Welcome back. Dr. Lonnie Leary is uh, with us, 25 years experience working as a a psychotherapist, and uh, she has sat with over 500 people as they died. She's the author of No One Has to Die Alone. I guess from a a religious uh, perspective, uh, uh, coming at it from a a Christian perspective, if there is a heaven and a hell, one would expect that that there would be um, near-death experiences that aren't too pleasant. I don't know that that people would necessarily report glimpses of, uh, you know, eternal damnation or or, uh, fire and brimstone, but um, as you were pointing out before the break, there have been some unpleasant uh, experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, we, but we tend to, we tend to hear the, uh, again, the ones of the, uh, you know, the, the bright light, the tunnel, the love, uh, being welcomed by those on the other side. Uh, again, going back to the people that you've sat with, these 500 dying patients, is there anything, um, that you've observed at the moment of death, mm. uh, that you found the unexpected? Uh, I'm thinking of, um, I've heard reports and nurses and so forth who've, who've told me on the air they've seen, they've seen, they, they believe they've witnessed the soul leaving the body. Uh huh. Have you have you seen anything like that? Well, I can I can feel the energy leave the body. One of the one of the things that happened to me when I returned was a lot of people will have um, um, heightened psychic abilities or uh, healing abilities. I have I, I returned with the ability to. Um, feel people's energy and to move pain out of the body um, and so I, I i can i can feel the energy um, leaving the physical body and sometimes hovering in the room um, that it, that no longer surprises me um, and certainly doesn't frighten me and but i i do experience that and what about family members uh, I, I don't know what if there's a name attached to this but the family members who's loved one is dying and has a near-death, um, what did you call that? Um, uh, near-death awareness? Near-death awareness. Uh-huh. Uh, do, do family members also sense something if they're gathered around the, uh, the, the, the you know, holding a vigil? You know, I, I don't find that very common. Um, the, the person who is leaving their body um, really has a, just a heightened heightened awareness people family members who are gathered around the bed are usually um pretty cloaked in um their own grief and that does make it difficult to um to get outside of themselves um and and one of the reasons that i think the work is so important is is because i i somehow can communicate through stories or encouragement that at the moment of death that the, the person is not suffering, that death, sometimes dying may be painful, but today with hospice and palliative care services, death, actually dying doesn't have to be painful, but certainly I know that the moment of death is not painful, and that we can continue to have a relationship with our loved one even after they die. Um, and that contact can occur, and that, you know, we need, let's pay attention. So pay attention to dreams. Pay attention to those things that, um, to the light that comes on or the music that comes on that normally uh, we might dismiss. Pay attention as the, op- you know, that that it might be an opportunity. Um, I, I think all of those things can be very comforting to both the person who's dying and to those who are grieving the loss of that loved one. As you're sitting with a patient, and let's let's assume for a moment that they have no, um, there's, there isn't a, a spiritual component to their life. They're not, uh-huh. they're, they're an agnostic or they're a, an, an atheist, uh-huh. uh, and they tell you that they are afraid to die. Uh, what what do you say to them? They're afraid to die. Well, I usually ask them, what do you think is the worst part of dying? So there's a lot of information in that that statement that we haven't gotten to yet. So I, I'll, I'll want to open that discussion up, and and they want someone so badly to listen to them because most people, when when they say that, when the patient says that to a family member, um, the family member will close down the conversation because they too are afraid of dying. But because I'm not afraid of dying, I can inquire with them. I can wonder with them. I can go there. What do you think is the worst part of dying or death? What do you think is the worst thing about death? Um, what do you imagine? What is your fantasy? What is your belief? 
And in that, then I can start to identify what they need. So oftentimes, a person is, what they're most afraid of about death is that people will forget them. Or they're afraid that they will die without before they were forgiven for something. Well, if I can hear that from the patient, then I know what they need. And, uh, for instance, um, I'm, uh, a patient says, you know, I, I just did some horrible things to my son, and I'm so afraid that um, he'll never forgive me and I'll never have another chance. Okay, well, w- would you be willing to talk to your son about that now? And so I might call the son in and say, this is important in order for your father to let go and die in peace. Would you be willing to hear his apology? Would you be willing to forgive him? Let's go back. Yes, that's that's um, exactly what I was looking for. Uh Um, I'll tell you what, uh, before I get to Faye here, uh, uh, and thanks, Faye, for holding on. uh, I'm not, uh, like you, I'm not afraid of, of, you know, what's beyond death. Um, I am somewhat nervous about the dying process uh, right. if it's you know a long agonizing right. process in particular the idea of of struggling for breath i, I happen to be very claustrophobic and uh-huh. uh, so the idea of that sensation that i'm not getting enough oxygen into my lungs i it, it can be a, I, mm-hmm. I can go into a panic okay so that that fear i have what would you okay. tell me but see, Richard, that's so helpful to know, because if I was working with you, then I would be able to work with the, um, the hospice nurses or your physician to really address that need, and um, we'd always have oxygen there for you. We would have a physical therapist there perhaps with you um, to do exercises with you that expanded and opened up your chest and your lungs. Um, I would be able to relieve some anxiety with massage and touch which a lot of the dying do not get. Um, and we would talk directly about your fear and what helped and what doesn't. Interesting. That's, you know, that's, an, that's a very good point. You know, the, that we, we just tend to cast off the dying. They're still a patient up, into, up to the moment. They're living right up. Yes. I want them to live right up to the last moment of their, of their life. And there are so many ways that we can help and make that happen. And one of the ways is by having these conversations with our loved ones right now, before you need to have them, when you are conscious and you're not terribly emotional because, uh, and you're not fearful because you don't have a terminal illness. We need to be having these conversations around the dinner table. And um, so I get called into families um, often because uh, mom is getting older, and um, the daughter doesn't know what her wishes are, but she's afraid to ask mom. And the reason she's afraid to ask is because she doesn't want mom to think, you're becoming a burden, and I just want you to die. So I go into the home, and I model. I give them the language. I show them what it looks like to have that conversation. And I might sit down with the mom and say, you know, Betty, I am so glad that I live to be 58. Um, actually, I guess I'm 59. Um, I'm so glad that I live to be 59 because I've just gotten information about what it takes to be an organ and tissue donor. And I figured out um, uh, that I want to be cremated and where I want my ashes. And I'm so glad that I figured this out so that I can tell my loved ones so they can really make sure I get what I want. And I'll go through a whole lot of different scenarios and, cho- and decisions that I need to make before my death. And then I'll say, and Betty, I wonder if you've thought about any of those things. Because, you know, I know your daughter wants to support your wishes, but it's really hard to do that if she doesn't know what they are. Indeed. Well, so can we start to have that conversation? You know, just little bit by little bit. But um, we do not want to die and let our legacy be... Uh, that what we've left behind is that our loved ones are anxious and grief stricken and feel guilty because they didn't do they didn't know what we wanted and they might have done the wrong thing. Death is in the West. Death is failure. It's perceived as a failure by the medical community. We have yep. lost one. Uh, it's yep. to be avoided at all costs. Instead of it's just another part of life. It's and it can be beautiful. Death can be it, beautiful. This can be the most intimate time in a relationship instead of a train wreck. And if we don't talk about it, if we're not present with each other, 
it can become a train wreck that wounds us for the rest of our life. Those Excellent that are, point. you know, the survivors. Excellent point. Faye is near Toronto. Faye, welcome to the Conspiracy Show. Hey, Richard. Hi there. I have this show every week. Thanks for taking my call. I just wanted to say that I um, have a similar experience to the doctor, only it was 42 years ago. Mm. When I was 20 years old, and I was a mother of a five-week-old baby at the time. Uh huh. And I, since I'd just given birth, I I couldn't believe how much I loved that little thing. Yes. But I was quite willing to abandon him to go into that tunnel. Uh huh. Yeah. And my and my dad, who had died actually six days earlier, was at the tunnel and told me to go back. It wasn't my time. Yeah. Yeah. When you came back, Faye, was there guilt because you felt that way? About your daughter? No, it wasn't guilt, really. I mean, later it was, but at the time, it was just so much regret that I did come back. Uh-huh, right. It wasn't anything about, I didn't feel guilty till later, but I so wanted to go in that tunnel. I wanted to be with my dad. It was just so beautiful right. that it was beyond description. Plus, before that time, I was very fearful of death, and um, my dad had a long battle with cancer, so none of that was pleasant, but yet... After that experience, I wasn't afraid at all. And did you experience your father as healed? Yes, he looked uh-huh. actually before he looked, he actually died when he was 49. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So he looked very bad at the end, but he looked like his old self again. Yep. Yeah. And, and so happy looking. And, but I, but he just put his hand up like almost like a stop sign, like, mm-hmm. no, mm-hmm. go back. Mm-hmm. But, um, I, I actually say isn't really my name, but I don't want to give it because this experience is also very private. Yes. And I didn't tell anybody except my doctor. I actually was having, I had to have an emergency operation and he dismissed it out of hand. That yes. Obviously it was lack of oxygen to the brain, but I just wonder why are the, and I didn't read anything until I was about 37 and I was shocked that anyone else had, had yes. the same experience. And then I was like, wow, that's just like mine. Right. Yeah, I, when I came back, I hadn't known anyone that had the experience either, and it's very, very isolating, and you don't really even have the words to um, describe it, but it is very, um, yeah, it's, it's very isolating and um, confusing. Faye yeah. in Toronto, thank you for the call. Thank you, Faye. And, um, wow, uh, Dr. Leary, I don't know where that hour went, but uh-huh. uh, <laughs> uh, it's gone, and I thank you for spending it with us. And um, we'll have to do this again because, there, obviously, there's so many aspects uh, that we didn't cover. I'd uh, love to. So I, I appreciate your time. Thank you again, Dr. Lonnie Leary and the, uh, the author of the book, No One Has to Die Alone. Give us a website very quickly, Dr. Leary. Uh-huh. I blog for psychologytoday.com. And I also have my own personal website, and that's uh, uh, Dr. D.R. Lonnie, L-A-N-I, Leary, L-E-A-R-Y dot com. And I write a blog on there, and you can also consult with me there. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha to you, too. All right. My thanks to uh, David Gaskin for uh, his technical production. And uh, thanks to the new guy, Tim. I don't know your last name yet, but we will get to know each other. You may regret it. (laughs) Uh, All right, back uh, with a whole slate of new shows. The Shroud of Turin, The Bilderbergs, Psychic Bigfoot, and much more. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night.